Hey everyone, this is Erin joining you for our third COVID Decoded Live series. We're really excited for Raw Talk's first ever virtual live event series, so thank you all for tuning in. But before we begin, we wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we're incredibly grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Now, for those of you who are new to the podcast, Raw Talk is a graduate student-run show about the meaning we find in science and the people who make it happen. We talk to scientists, students, clinicians, and patients behind scientific innovations and advances happening at the University of Toronto and around the world. So don't forget to check out our website linked in the description box below for access to all of our episodes. But you can also find us on whichever platform you use for all of your favorite podcast content. Now, like so many of us over the last few months, you've probably been trying to wrap your mind around the scale and the impact of the current COVID-19 pandemic. But the rapid pace of COVID-19 discovery and evolving public health situation have made it really hard to keep up. And as we adjust to the new normal, it's clear that the current pandemic has far reaching effects on health, research, society, and even our planet as a whole. So we decided to turn our annual live podcasting event into a live stream series all about COVID-19 to answer all of your questions. But this series would not have been possible without the support of our Pillar Affinity sponsors, TD Insurance and MBNA. So thank you for helping make this series possible for our team. And check out the link in the description below to learn about preferred insurance rates and credit card rewards for U of T alumni. I'd also like to personally take a brief moment to say a huge thank you to our incredible and massive team working on this live series. It's been a huge coordinated effort and learning curve as we've moved to this new video medium over the past few months, and this wouldn't have been possible without each and every single one of you. And a very spe special shout out to Alex, who's been our audio engineer genius, and Kat, my co-PR exec and today's moderator, who's kept all of us organized throughout this entire process. Now for our first episode, Yagnesh sat down with Dr. Karen Mossman and learned about how coronaviruses infect human cells and cause disease, and why understanding those mechanisms is the key to designing treatment and interventions. Last week, Jesse sat down with Dr. Sharmista Mishra and Lin Wei Wang to discuss mathematical modeling, special considerations of COVID-19 modeling in Canada, and how lessons learned can inform our public health interventions. In today's third installment, we will be discussing the current and long-term psychological impacts of COVID-19 on all of us, as we acknowledge that this pandemic is very much a shared experience. But we also want to highlight in particular the mental health impact on frontline healthcare workers and on Black communities, as well as what changes are needed moving forward within our mental health system. I have the pleasure of being joined today by two guests who will share their expertise on these topics. Dr. Rima Styra is an Associate Professor of Psychiatry at the University of Toronto and works as a Clinician Investigator at the University Health Network. She's been funded by the University of Toronto COVID-19 Action Fund to survey mental health outcomes of healthcare workers in Toronto during the pandemic. Donna Alexander is a social worker specializing in addiction and mental health at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health and serves on the board of Black Mental Health Canada and previously served as Vice President of Black Health Alliance. Welcome Rima and Donna. How are you both today? Fine. Thank you very much for having us. Thank you. Thank you for having us. I'm fine as well. Thank you both for joining us today. It's been, um, we're really, really excited for today's discussion. Um, so I thought that perhaps we could start our discussion today with just an acknowledgement that, you know, this has been a really sort of collective and shared traumatic experience. And it's been unlike any experience that, you know, most of us have, have had. And what's been particularly fascinating to experience and observe over the course of the pandemic is the trajectory of human behavior. When we started off, when the pandemic was first declared in mid-March, there was potentially a lot of disbelief and shock that something um, this extreme could happen to this uh, gravity. And then we moved towards you know, some evolving hoarding behaviors from hand sanitizers to masks to flour and yeast, which I also experienced, um, and then perhaps to a sense of fear and loss about what life used to be like before COVID. Um, so, you know, from your perspective, is this something that you've also experienced and observed? And um, I guess, what, do you, what are your thoughts on how this reflects the trajectory of human behavior or adaptation? Um, Rima, perhaps you can start us off. Erin, uh, I think you brought up a lot of interesting points and a lot of really valid points and a, a very common experience that everyone had. 
when we sort of started to hear about the pandemic. And, and I think when we started to hear about it, as you mentioned, it's not anything that any of us have ever experienced. And we heard about this emerging pathogen. And what we knew was there was no treatment that was available. And that's a very scary feeling, provoking a lot of anxiety in all of us. I think when we heard about it, and it was happening in China and Wuhan, many people felt a sense of denial. You know, it was happening over there. Hopefully, we were going to be able to minimize the effects here. Maybe you wouldn't even come here. So there was that aspect. And then you talked about the hoarding. Um, and part of that was the control that we were trying to get. You know, if we could take care of our basic needs, it kind of decreases some of our anxiety. It also allowed us to have a sense of control in that we were doing something to try and minimize the risk. And I think the social distancing that was enacted also helped to kind of deal with some of the anxiety that we were experiencing, feeling, you know, we're actively doing something to try and help ourselves and to help yeah. others. I think what's happened as we've gone on, we've seen some positives in that we've been able to flatten the curve, the numbers are decreasing, we're seeing people recovering, but we also have to think about some of the negatives where people have been lost, uh, lives have been lost, there's a grief that's gone on, and also when you think about what we're doing moving forwards, you talked about the new normal, and the new normal is not what we no, it's actually something that is in many ways disappointing for many because we're not moving forwards as quickly as we'd like to. And yet we also need to maintain the fact that we need to mitigate the contagious nature of this particular virus and try and protect everyone who's involved. Donna, do you have anything to add? I think it also speaks to our power to adapt. Mm -hmm. Because I think as the course, you know, as the months or weeks went by, what we saw was originally the fear. And then eventually people start to adapt yeah. to the new norm, to the new situation, right? So I think more than anything else, it speaks to the, the power of human beings to adapt to environments and to situations, right? Yeah. I think it speaks to that. Yeah. I think you yes. both raised mm -hmm. really important points. And yeah, it's just been really incredible to see the power of human resilience and adaptation as we've all kind of experienced this together. Um, and one, I think, component that has been really playing a huge role in the course of the pandemic is the role of media and social media. And it's been a very powerful tool to spread messaging very quickly, especially as um, the information that we know is evolving very rapidly. Um, but I think the flip side is that it also can potentially create um, some mental health impacts. And I'm wondering if um, you can both speak to the impact of uh, media and social media on mental health within the context of this pandemic. Um, Rima, would you like to start us off? Okay. So I, I think in terms of media, what was happening was that we all felt a bit overwhelmed with all the media. Yeah. And part of it was the fact that it was coming at us fast. It was something that we focused on. It was something that we kept watching. It was almost addictive in its nature that we wanted to have this information and learn more about it. But we were also becoming overwhelmed because many of us in healthcare and I'm sure in other professions and in other workplaces, were getting numerous emails, information from friends, social media. Everybody was telling us about COVID-19. So obviously very overwhelming, anxiety provoking. And the other thing was that the information sometimes was not correct. There was some misinformation that was provided and that was very concerning for many people. And it was hard to sort of sort out which was the correct info, what might be wrong. The other thing was that the information changed over time. And that's very hard for us as well because it just added to the uncertainty. You know, we had information that this was happening one day and the next day the information had changed. So I think, as John had mentioned, we do adapt well, but it's very hard when that information keeps changing on one all the time. So definitely increased our anxiety and stress. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And is that something that either of you saw clinically as well? Donna? Sure, Donna. Um, yes. And so. 
I think really spoke very generally about the mental health impact. And so what I wanted to do, I wanted to, um, to focus because I think our experiences are very different, right? And so when we talk about the mental health impact, I think that our community, my community has been hit especially hard yeah. with this virus, right? And I think in some respect, the, the virus was the straw that broke the camel's back because we were already, as a, as a vulnerable community, we were already coping. Um, we were already coping with so many other issues, right? In terms of, you know, uh, the social exclusion, all the other social factors. And then we had, uh, you know, what was going on in terms of, of you know, the racial tensions and, and the, 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 the trauma resulting from that, right? So in terms of, her, oh, of the mental health impact, um, it was an added factor for us, right? Because we we also started in the middle of this pandemic. We also a lot of us started to experience racial stress, racial trauma, and the racial battle fatigue that came with that, right? Because we yes, we're in the middle of the pandemic, but like one of my co my my coworker would say, racism didn't go into quarantine, right? And so even in Toronto, where you see there were presence of nooses in certain environments, right? And so, you know, that's why I say that to a lot of us, it's cumulative, right? And so the impact and, and the community, and I can't speak obviously for the for the entire community, but I think, you know, in general, the, you know, a lot of us, you know, um, it's, it's yes, it's the, it's the COVID related anxiety, but it's also the racial trauma that we, we're dealing with. It's the depression. It's all of those other things like now we're having where people were starting to present with, with um, OCD like behaviors, right? So we have all of those things, as well as all the, the, the psychological impact, the, the, the isolation, you know, the fear, like I talk about not wanting to leave the house, um, feeling trapped, right? All of those things. And uh, for some people, concurrent disorders, right? Where yes, they're also dealing with the mental health aspect, but they're also now starting to deal with substance use issues as well, right? So it so it's so multifaceted and multi-layered, right? In terms of of all the the mental health issues that that's been going on in general for the general population, but in particularly for for the African diaspora and and the lack of control, you know, the lack of control that we that that some of us feel. So it's multi-layered for us. Yeah. It's you know it's yeah, Donna, you bra you raised many very important points and. Um, I think maybe we can unpack a little bit more about the very important point about racial trauma and, you know, particularly towards anti-black racism, but we've also seen anti-indigenous racism um, and anti-Asian racism. And there's been a lot that's been exacerbated by the current context of the pandemic. Bye. And I'm wondering if you can help us unpack mm -hmm. that a little bit more. I think when, when times of uncertainty, in times of uncertainty and fear, um, I, I think part of it is that, you know, it's, it's right when people start to lose control, when the future is uncertain, I, I think to some extent that is a response. It's a human response. Right. So so part of it is that right where 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 it's, you know, people start to look for rationale. Right. Why is this happening? Right. And in the absence of that, in, in the absence of complete clarity, then then and then, you know, with the narrative. Right. Because m much of the narrative that 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 has been that has happened for, from leaders or from um, from people of influence. Right. Much of that narrative have not been positive. Right. Much of that narrative have, have not been where it has united people. Much of that narrative really, in fact, served to divide people. And, and people are, are, are influenced by this, right? Because like you said, people consume so much media, so much news. There are people that were seemingly that they were addicted to the news, where they, they, they listen to the news cycle for 24 hours. You know, they were always have the, the news, right? And, and just consuming all of this negative you know, information, it does have an influence on us, right? And 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 so a lot, we are not immune to it. We, we don't live where we're totally insulated. All of this have a negative impact on us. Mm -hmm. And and whether we like it or not, you know, that's that's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, mm -hmm. I, and I like your point about how 
really human beings strive to search for meaning and try to understand situations and in the absence of certainty then people look for other responses or other reasonings or rationales to kind of make sense of their world and sometimes that can be mm -hmm. uh, misguided. Um, something that you mm -hmm. also raised I think was the uh, factor of social isolation within the context of the pandemic and I can imagine that especially towards the beginning of the pandemic, that was something that was quite drastic and quite um, the opposite of what we're used to within our society. We're a very social society. Um, and so I'm wondering, what are the psychological impacts or the mental health impacts of social isolation during quarantine? And I know, Rima, you're, um, you have looked at this in the past as well, and in the context of the 2003 SARS epidemic. I'm wondering if you can comment on um, the mental health impact of social isolation in particular. So we did some work basically during 2003 when we had mm -hmm. SARS here in Toronto and we looked at the general population and what we found was that a lot of people started to express symptoms of depression and post-traumatic stress symptoms and post-traumatic stress symptoms include difficulty concentrating, difficulty with sleep, um, bad dreams, irritability, increased anxiety, yeah, increased anger. Mm -hmm. um, depressed mood, uh, trying to avoid various kinds of situations. And so what we found was about a third were experiencing some symptoms of depression and a third experienced some mm -hmm. post-traumatic stress symptoms. So the isolation really played up at, during that point in terms of aggravating our mental health. SARS was, was a lot more limited and the individuals who were quarantined often also had some exposure to someone had so they also have the whole aspect of really trying to sort of deal with the fact that they might actually have also become infected with SARS. Now it was more of a general experience. Uh, we were in this together. But one of the things that we learned from SARS was that, that people really, information was very important. So if there was a lack of information, there was increased stress. We also found that people who basically had more economic issues mm -hmm. also experienced more symptoms, which is understandable. And also, the longer you were in quarantine, the more likely you were to have symptoms. So I think, you know, when we think about COVID-19 and the longer time period that we've all been in self-isolation, definitely we would expect that we would see a fair amount of depressive symptoms and post-traumatic yeah. stress symptoms. And I think as Donna sort of talked about the fact that we all have goals and, you know, if we're become demotivated, we tend to become more depressed. Social beings, we enjoy contact with other individuals. It gives us meaning in terms of having a role, in terms of our work and our interactions. And those are very important for us. And when we lose them, even though we have now sort of like contact through technology, it's still not the same as mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I, you know, as I, I was mentioning before, I think our society really operates in this very re relational way and connection and human connection is so important. And, you know, it's one thing to be connected online like we are right now, but it's another thing to be in the room uh, with people. And Donna, I'm wondering if you can also comment on the impact of social isolation on black communities in particular, and if there are sort of maybe cultural factors that actually might exacerbate that impact. Yes, yeah, so for us, um, the connection to family, we're mostly collectivist culture, right? And so that social con connection is really important to us, right? And so, yes, we're in the middle of a pandemic, but we also have or ex also experiencing these life transitions, right? People, I mean, just today, one of my clients said that her, her grandfather died, right? The client before reported that his friend died, um, completed suicide this past week. And so in the middle of this pandemic, right, all of these, uh, the rituals that we would normally engage with, the rituals around mourning, right? The rituals around celebration, the rituals around all of these social engagements and the way we structure our life, our lives, all of that, um, we, we're not able to do. And so psychologically, that have a huge effect on us, right? And we also have to look at, in general, in terms of, 
what the social isolation is doing to families. You know, the familial breakdown that occurs when families are not able to gather and to get together the way how they would normally, you know, intergenerationally. When grandchildren are separated from grandparents, right? When when people are not able to see each other, like we were talking about for such a prolonged period of time, but also the impact on productivity, right? So we we have to talk about that as well, and the familiar, the breakdown in terms of intimate relationships as well, mm-hmm. right? Because you know, like with people, and, and this is the other thing we don't talk about. We, we haven't, you know, like for, for those of us, for, for, for the, those of us right now that are sta- stably housed, right? That we were able to shelter in place and we were able to quarantine safely. We lo- it's hard for us to imagine for people that, are, that were not stably housed, people that were in the shelter system, for people who the, the shelter systems could not accommodate, right? And who, who in the shelter system you were sharing a room, and so you were not able to do that, and the level of stress that it had, because for some people the shelter system really was their social network. That's where they felt connected, and that's where they got their their level of support from, right? And with the pandemic, all of these places, you know, they had to change their model of service. Where, where they could no longer offer drop-in services, right? And so we have this generation of, of youth or young people, or even adults, right, with nowhere to go during this pandemic, because some of them are now housed in in hotel rooms, right? Yeah. But, but they don't have that community, so it's a loss of community, right? Mm-hmm. A lot of people they had, you know, where they had their routine, right? And they had a solid support that no longer exists for them. Yeah, and thank you for raising that really important point. And we're going to continue to unpack that a little bit more um, in future episodes as well, because um, you know to really address other at-risk groups and more vulnerable groups that have been impacted um, disproportionately by COVID, um, including those that are vulnerably housed. And we're going to have a separate episode down the line on health equity and socioeconomic impact. So I'm really looking forward to unpacking that further. But thank you for raising that. Um, but I also wanted to uh, potentially talk about some other at-risk groups, in, again, in the context of social isolation. You meant, uh, uh, Donna, you mentioned um, end-of-life practices and funerals, and that's something that's been impacted a lot, funerals, weddings, but also um, visitor policies in hospitals and long-term care homes and having no, no visitor policies. And um, I'm wondering if either of you could comment a little bit more on some of those other at-risk groups um, in the context of social isolation and in the pandemic. Rima? All right, so uh, I was thinking about the fact that you were referring to the no visitor policies that we were also having within our hospital system and long-term care facilities. And, And to tell you the truth, it really raised a lot of moral distress for the healthcare workers. So we're used to basically helping patients, and taking care of them, and also taking care of their families because there's real concern when they're there, they're helpful, we interact with them, we provide them with information. And part of the problem was that we were experiencing this moral distress about the fact that patients were dying without family being there. And so healthcare workers themselves were a very vulnerable population to this distress at this point that we were really not able to help our patients the way we wanted to help. And I think that's something that is important for people to also realize that when we were talking about the fact that at one point we thought we were going to have ventilators for everyone, we were very vulnerable in terms of saying, oh my gosh, how are they going to choose which patient gets a ventilator and who does not? So lots of concerns for healthcare workers as well were arising in terms of feeling vulnerable during this pandemic. I think another vulnerable patient population were those who were severely mentally ill mm-hmm. because it was very, very hard for them to sometimes make contact. Even though we had virtual care, many of them don't have access to virtual care. So they lost, as Donna said, their connection, their community basically was lost. That was a very vulnerable group. And the other vulnerable groups were the patients who were elderly. Mm-hmm. 
self-identified themselves as being very vulnerable because they often had morbidities, they felt isolated from their healthcare systems, they were terrified about going outside because they had been told, you are the group that's going to get COVID-19 and you're like, a lot of anxiety and a lot of concern in those particular yeah. groups. Um, Reem, I'm having a little bit of difficulty hearing you. I'm wondering if you could um, just move a little bit closer to the computer. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I can to... hear you much better. Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. No, that's okay. That's okay. Um, but I think, again, you raise a really important point, with, uh, especially with the elderly, and I think that that was something that was already an issue prior to COVID, um, that they were at risk of the mental health impact of social isolation. That was already an, a pre-existing issue, and that was probably exacerbated again by the pandemic. Um, and you, you also spoke a little bit about the psychological impact on healthcare workers. And I'm wondering if we can talk a little bit more about that now. Um, I know that you are currently conduct conducting a study looking at the psychological effects on healthcare workers. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about the study that you're conducting now? So we just have some preliminary okay. results. And so we have, can't really share that much, okay. but we've had a tremendous response. We've got about 3,000 healthcare workers who have responded to our survey. So some of the things that we're going to find are probably fairly similar to some of the things that we saw during SARS when we looked at healthcare workers. And of course, there's the apprehension, the fear of becoming infected themselves, but also the fear of family being infected. And also one of the things that comes up is the fact that lots of the healthcare workers also experience a lot of distress about the environment that they were working in because of some of the concerns that were occurring within those environments. So I think we're going to see a lot of um, expression of those concerns from this particular survey. Yeah. But I can tell you that one of the things that was also occurring with healthcare workers compared to SARS, we were all going to be deployed. So we were told that in case there was a shortage of healthcare workers, we would actually be removed from the units that we were working in and also the teams that we work with. And, and teams are very important for us because they provide us with support and they provide us with guidance and we're all used to working together and we would be removed from those particular environments. And of course, the media was also a shortage of people. Again, it was very concerning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the other thing that I thought of was um, you know, the, the shortage of PPE at the beginning of the pandemic, and I'm wondering if that also kind of played into uh, the mental health impact on healthcare workers specifically. Yes. So the shortage of PPE basically was tremendously concerning because what we were seeing from the United States especially was the lack of ventilators, the lack of PPE. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, our hospitals were trying very hard to make sure that we had an adequate supply. Mm -hmm. But And here's where media comes in to play because we were hearing all of these drastic sort of measures that were having to happen down south and we were scared whether this was going to be coming our way as well. Mm -hmm. We do have limitations in the amount of PPE that we have. People are very conscientious of that. We have actually tried to save our PPE as much as possible. But of course, it was a definite concern for all of the healthcare workers and just raised their distress and anxiety. Yeah. And it also raised the distress and anxiety of the healthcare worker families mm -hmm. who saw the healthcare workers going to work every single day, coming back working long hours, wearing a mask, wearing a shield, feeling mm -hmm. fatigued, and coming home to the home environment. And also concerns for the families, basically, as to whether this particular healthcare worker or their loved one might become infected themselves, but might also bring it home mm -hmm. to possibly children or elderly parents yeah. if they were living with them. Yeah, it was certainly very multifaceted and lots of different um, factors playing into the mental health impact on healthcare workers. And, you know, as healthcare workers yourselves, I'm wondering if, if you're comfortable commenting if you've personally experienced um, a mental health impact of throughout this uh, pandemic and how have either or both of you been coping? Donna? <coughs> 
I'm just checking to see if I was muted. I think I was muted. Okay. So, so I think it's important to, to know that, you know, we are, we who, you know, provide service, we are not immune to the effects, right, of environmental forces, of stressors, right, of trauma, right? And some of us, you know, if we are being honest with ourselves, along the somewhere throughout the course of our career, we are at risk. We are at high risk for vicarious trauma. We're at high risk for secondary trauma, and we're at high risk for compassion fatigue, right? And so that's just the reality of, of, of providing services, right? And so, yes, it wasn't, you know, like, especially during this period where, you know, where it was, it's extremely stressful, where, yes, I mean, I've, you know, you know, I've had to access my own support, you know? Mm -hmm. I, there's a mental health team that every Friday we get together and I try to be present for that as much as possible in order to get the level of support that I need, right? Because I think it's important for us that are providing the services that are clinicians for us to be well, right? I think it's really important for us to be well so that we can serve our clients to the best of our ability. Yeah. And in order to do that, we also have to be, be very conscious right and be very mindful be very intentional of the need for self-care you know in order to be able to provide to 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 really meet the needs of the clients mm -hmm. right and so i've had to be very throughout this period i've had to be very intentional about my need to take space and to access the level of support that i need yeah. and and i do it knowing that it's the right thing for me to do mm -hmm. Right, and that it would be a disservice to my clients for me not to do this and to try it. And it's a balance, you know, trying to create this balance, right? Because for, like I said, for us, you know, especially the black clinicians, it's multi-layered, right? Because we also had to deal with the racial trauma and being triggered. And so, yes, we, we you know, there, it was not unusual for people to be crying in between clients, right? Mm -hmm. And so a lot of us, we knew that we had to access support for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Thank you, Donna, for sharing. And I think those are really important to highlight. And I think um, our viewers would also appreciate having this discussion. I think throughout this entire pandemic, healthcare workers and other essential workers have been um, praised. And obviously, we've been very grateful to um, frontline healthcare workers and other essential workers. Um, but I think part of that, it, it's almost this kind of hero um, mentality. And we also need to look out for the mental health of those that are providing us with care and essential services. Um, Rima, I'm not sure if you had any other further thoughts to share. Well, I, I think Donna actually brought up some really important points and that we all need to be aware of taking care of ourselves. And mm -hmm. I think one of the things that happened when the pandemic was coming, we all thought about our patients as well. Mm -hmm. And how are we going to be able to take care of our patients? We have so many patients who are vulnerable and have needs basically that work very hard to support them and help them and many of them do quite well but they need this ongoing support mm -hmm. part of the problem was that we were very concerned in terms of providing this care but one of the positives that did come up was the virtual care mm -hmm. and all of a sudden we were able to connect with many of our patients and we were able to reach out and provide them with support at least on that particular level mm -hmm. And we've also learned new skills basically by doing that because previously a lot of healthcare workers did some telehealth and whatever, but it wasn't the majority of their practice. Mm -hmm. Well, all of us have become a lot more familiar with it and a lot more adept at it. And so maybe that's going to actually help increase, increase some of the access for individuals as well. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the positives that I think we experienced that we were pleased enough to see that we can continue to practice and help and support our clients. Yeah, definitely. I think a lot of people are a lot more familiar with OTN now um, moving forward and hopefully that'll be a really good um, move in terms of increasing virtual care supports because I think that was something that was um, increasing steadily for a while, but maybe this is kind of that final push to really make it more mainstream. Um, and based off of our discussion so far, it's been really clear that mental health needs have been increasing throughout this pandemic. And I'm wondering if you can, we can take this time now to comment a little bit on how mental health services have needed to adopt um, 
their sort of structures to kind of accommodate these increasing needs maybe you can comment within your own institutions donna i don't know if you would like to start i think what rita was just saying before was part was had to move mostly to web-based services right and also telephone because some clients in terms of their anxiety their anxiety increases by actually seeing themselves on the screen but i think i think it's a recognition that you know we it cannot be where it's a one-size-fits-all approach where we'll have to look at clients on an individual basis, right? And say, based on this client's presentation, what would work for this client? And how can we be flexible in terms of our service planning, in terms of our service provision, right? How can we plan service? Because I think so far the tendency has always been very rigid in terms of this. these are the universal practices, right? Um, before this pandemic, we had strict policies about, oh, you know, communication with clients and, and the, the, the scope and what that would look like, right? And I think this changed things because there was a recognition, there gradually was a recognition that what one work, what, what might work for one client might not necessarily work for another client, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, I think if, you know, like we've had to be very flexible, right? In terms of really considering the client needs and figuring out how we're going to meet those needs depending on the clients and not just lumping all the clients together and say, okay, well, if this works for you, then this will work for you, right? Because some of my clients, yes, some of them prefer this kind of interactions, but some of them might prefer phone because you're self-conscious about being seen, right? Mm -hmm. And so, yes, you might start out like this, and then once you've seen the client, then you might switch to phone session, right? Because that's what the clients. And so it's about really changing our practice to, to, to procedures that are more client centered, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And we've, you know, that's a learning curve for us. But I think throughout all of this, we learned that we can be a lot more flexible in our mm -hmm. practice. Mm -hmm. That's what that's this is what this is proved to us, proven to us, which is a really important lesson as well. Um, Rima, mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you can comment on any changes that have perhaps happened within UHN or um, have there been any increase in services for healthcare workers specifically um, with regards to their mental health needs? Right. So, in terms of UHN, just to sort of summarize around the clients basically, mm -hmm. uh, the hospital was very helpful in trying to get everybody registered as possible for OTN, uh, which was very helpful. There was a mass rush, and so they assigned some coordinators to help us actually provide support in terms of getting onto OTN. The other aspect was that, as Donna mentioned, phone was also available for clients because some clients prefer phone or don't really have the technology available to use. Um, our emergency services continued on if people needed those. In terms of healthcare workers, there has been an outpouring of support. So there are various support programs within our own hospital system. There are support programs from organizations, associations, various other groups that have offered support. Um, we have employee um, programs basically, but we also have various individual therapists who have offered their services for healthcare workers. So a tremendous amount of support that's come out for healthcare workers, absolutely. Someone can find something that will suit their particular needs. And I think this came out of the fact that during SARS, we noticed that there was not as much support for healthcare workers. And this time people learned the lesson that we really need to take care of them, basically. I also think what happened also, one of the things nobody talks about is some of the practical needs that healthcare workers had and it was also very thankful that people were able to get groceries mm -hmm. when they were kind of in between shifts and whatever and had very little time yeah. so appreciated the community support there as well yeah all of the initiatives that were happening as the pandemic started i think um especially around support for healthcare workers has been really tremendous and um, incredible 
and also as a side note for all of you viewers listening we have compiled a list of mental health resources and other articles and media appearances from both rima and donna that will be including in the description below so if you are in need or want somewhere to kind of look for further resources definitely check that out as a first step and i think both of you alluded to this but i think a lot of these mental health impacts are not acute they're going to continue for a long period of time after the pandemic and we're still in it and some have you know called it an echo pandemic an impending mental health crisis that will follow and i'm wondering what are some of those long-term psychological impacts and i know we've talked a little bit about it in terms of traumatic stress symptoms and anxiety and depression but if we can talk about that a little bit more uh, Rima, I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. I think what we're going to see is that we're going to see a lot of people as things start to return to normal, actually starting to seek mental health mm -hmm. support because right now they've been preoccupied with other things, but they're going to start reflecting a little bit more and realizing maybe I'm not functioning as well as I could be. The other thing that I think is a major impact is the economic downturn that we've seen. There have been so many people who've lost their jobs. That's going to have an impact on their mental health. Angus Reid did a survey of 2,000 Canadians, and what they found that 50% of them said that there's been a negative impact on their mental health. So I think we're going to see a lot more moving forwards. I also think that part of what's happened as well is our severe mentally ill patients have not actually been receiving all the care that they should because they weren't able to connect. So I think we're going to have more and more people coming to the mental health services, seeking assistance in the emergency, whereas if we had been sort of moving along a little bit better, we would have been able to help these clients. And I think Don also alluded to the fact at one point about substance use, we're seeing increased numbers in terms of substance use because people are turning to alternatives in terms of trying to self-medicate themselves at this point and that's becoming more of a crisis at present. Mm -hmm. Donna, do you have anything to add? Oh, you're mute. <laughs> so yes, yeah, Serena touched on all the most um, salient points, but one thing that we, we're going to have expect to see as well is a lot of dependence um when it comes to gaming right you know um video games because throughout this period a lot of people have been gaming more a lot of people have been uh, um, have a lot of time you know to to spend on social media and so the dependence is social media right as well as other things such as excessive pornography or gambling, right? So all of these things that that people that lacked the support that they needed, that they turned to all of these other things, right? Um, the online, the world of online, all the other things that you can do, like the interactive games that people play, right? And people are already reporting that, right? So I think post pandemic, we'll see a lot more of that. Not only people that, that are concurrently disordered, but people who the transition back will be a lot more difficult because of this addiction to all of these interactive games and all the other things that they that they do, that they started to do while they were spending so much time alone during the mm -hmm. quarantine. Yes, so I think we'll definitely see that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Maybe we have time for one last question before we move on to audience questions. Um, we've talked a lot about the negative mental health impacts and outcomes from this pandemic. And I'm wondering, as a final question before we move on to the audience questions, if there have been any positive psychological impacts that have come through from this pandemic. Um, we talked a little bit initially about resilience, um, but I'm wondering if either of you have any further comments on what, what some of those positive psychological impacts might be. So, so I would say there, okay, so I would say that there's been a lot of altruism that we've actually seen in the community where people cared about each other and they were concerned about each other. They wanted to protect themselves, but they also wanted to protect others. And it would be really nice to see this kindness and caring moving forwards as time goes on. I also think that there's been a lot of self reflection by people. And one of the Big things that I think has happened is that people have a sense of gratitude as well. 
that we've been able to move forwards, but realize that there are many, many things that we still need to change and that we need to look at the positives, but also to look at the fact that there are many, many opportunities for us to improve at this point. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the positive things that I think have come out of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Donna, do you have any further thoughts? I think in addition to what Rina said, I think, you know, some organizations in terms of the way how they would usually do business, they started to change that. And I think some of them, it was a newfound care for their staff, right, and for the well-being of their staff. Um, and, and some of them have, you know, have gone out of their, you know, have really made an effort in order to care for the well-being of their staff and to show how much they appreciate what the staff, what their staff have contributed, right? And I think I'm hoping that will continue as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's some that still have a long ways to go, right? But for the but but for some of them, I can see, and my experience has been that some of them have really stepped up in order to care for the well-being of their staff and to say to, to say, you know what, and not only to say, but to really demonstrate, you know what, that by by action, by tangible action, that we care about you as a staff. We don't want to lose you, mm -hmm. and so. You know, these things that we have in place now, we're willing in the future to continue doing this. Mm -hmm. And that's so that's that's very encouraging for me. Mm -hmm. Thank you both. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to move on to some audience questions. Let's see here. Um, so this is kind of a topic that we've already discussed a little bit, but maybe we can um, tease it out a little bit more. But the question is, we know that loneliness has severe effects on our physiology and health. What can we do as a system and as individuals to ameliorate the social isolation amidst physical isolation, especially for vulnerable populations that have been discussed? So the focus specifically on social isolation and vulnerable populations. What can we do in order to? Um, ameliorate the social isolation. I think we have to plan services very differently than the way we're yeah. plan the way we've planned them. And we've started to do that, right? We've started to be more intentional about planning services, right? Even in, in the way how, how, how um, in the past, how, how some services were structured. I think in the future, we're going to see things structured very differently, right? I think in the future, what I'm hoping to see, for example, is more home visits, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you know, where people are out in the community more, mm -hmm. right? Where it's not where you're in this very isolating, very intimidating space, right? And people have to come to you. Where people, where there be more outreach into the community, mm -hmm. more outreach in spaces where people are comfortable. Mm -hmm. Because for a lot of people, access and service, for example, in some institutions are extremely intimidating mm -hmm. right so some people don't even want to do that and so you know now people are starting to think very differently you know they will have some psychiatrists that are now offering services in the community right because if if we're waiting for clients to come to us right a lot of times and that will never happen because the vulnerable the most vulnerable clients they don't have capacity and they're too afraid right so i think moving forward it will be an approach where where we we structure things more in a more user-friendly way. Yeah. yeah, and it. I think that's what we're going to have to do. Yeah, and I think it brings us back to the points that both of you raised about how our systems are going to need to change moving forward to accommodate um, changing needs. Um, one of the questions was asking about children and um, uh, younger adults, and I think this is something that we haven't touched on, so it might be interesting to um, hear your thoughts on this. But children, mm -hmm. the question is, children don't often articulate their worries. With return to school, emotional well-being will be paramount. Are there any organizations or uh, that you'd suggest to better support our students? Or maybe young adults in general? Rima? I, I actually don't work with children, okay. so I don't know any other resources. But I, I'm sure that some places like Hospital for Sick Kids and their Department of Psychology, our colleague worked on some resources in that respect. Mm -hmm. I, more familiar. I think the Child, the Child Development Institute, mm -hmm. um, I think they have resources. Um, 
I think youth link there's some you there's some resources out there that are um, uh, that their mandate is, is to serve youth um, so I think those I think some of the schools some of the schools are now in preparation phase where they're starting to prepare for September in terms of what do we need to do? What are the conversations we need to have with the students? And this conversation I know uh, started um, just before the end of the academic year in, in June, where the schools are saying, um, this is something we need to prepare the teachers for. And so I know that some of the, the some of the, in terms of the educational systems, there's some school boards right now that are already in preparation mode for all of this. Mm -hmm because they expect that moving forward in September there will this is something that will have to be taken factored into into the system mm -hmm. and re yes. related to that I'm wondering if you have um, any insights about mental health supports for parents um, whether that be currently or whether that be um, once school starts like you were mentioning about um, supports for children so Rina, do you want to talk or do you? I think specifically there are a number of psychiatrists who do family therapy and those might actually be the ones who might be the best to help support the parents in terms of having the younger kids going back to school. So those would be the resources and there is an association of family therapists that is available online for people if they want to access that. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we talked a little bit about virtual mental health care and the increased use of OTN. Um, I, I'm wondering if either of you have comments on what are some of the challenges of the increased use of virtual mental health care? Oh, okay. I'm, <laughs> no challenges, you know, I, it's perfect. <laughs> yes, I, you know, I miss my clients. I, you know, I'm a social worker. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm used to face to face. I'm used to this contact. I'm used to the smiles. The, I, I you know, so I, 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 I miss. I miss the connection as well. Yeah. I, you know, I and my clients, they, they miss it too. They, they keep asking me, you know, miss, when are we going every day, mm -hmm. right? When are we going back to face to face? And I keep having to say, well, we're waiting. We're in phase two. We're, we're waiting. We're, you know, hopefully we'll ramp things up, right? Um, and so. Yes, I mean, in some way, this might be convenient for some because they won't have to travel. And some really travel long distances, right? And so, but for the most part, people are saying that that yes, this is good and this this is useful for for sometimes, right? For sometimes, you know, in a pinch, this is useful, but people really crave the face-to-face -face contact. And so, the challenge is in doing this, right? Especially over the, you can't judge effect you can't really see you can't gauge body language you can't judge demeanor it's yeah so that those are the challenges right yeah. that comes with this yes. Reem, i see you smiling is that something that you also can relate to oh very much so <laughs> i think it's pinned it down where you know mental health is really all about connection mm -hmm. and being with the client and interacting mm -hmm. with them and seeing them and oftentimes seeing who brings in the client and having information from them. So it's very, very helpful. We really like sort of the face to face. Mm -hmm. um, I think for some clients, as Donna mentioned, the virtual care, the OTN mm -hmm. is going to be a benefit because a lot of the clients are also talking about the fact it's expensive to go to downtown Toronto, parking is expensive. Sometimes if it's an elderly patient, then a family member has to bring them down, they have to take time off of work, those kinds of issues. So I think we're going to see some positives and some negatives, but yeah. very much enjoy seeing our clients on a face-to-face -face basis, I'll say that. Yeah, and that's definitely unique and, you know, sp very specific to mental health care. That's that's the nature and that's the root of, of that delivery of care. And I can imagine even if you are able to start seeing patients in person, there's a lot of PPE and masks and that also impedes what you see in terms of facial expressions. And um, so I can imagine that that's also going to be an issue moving forward. Patients comment on this in the <laughs> hospital, <laughs> walk in and they go, I can hardly <laughs> see you, you know, because we've got our mask mm -hmm. on, we, we also our shield, we, we, it just, you don't get that personal look. Mm -hmm. And part of 
what we do is we react with our face. You know, our face says a lot and they can't see it. And, and that's really distressing for them as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the demonstration of empathy, I think, from mental health care workers, that's something that patients really mm -hmm. resonate with. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that's it for our audience questions. We have a couple minutes left. And I'm wondering, as my final question to both of you, um, given what we've seen so far and, and all of the anticipated long-term psychological conse consequences, what are the changes that um, both of you personally would like to see within our mental health system? What's the ideal case scenario moving forward for both of you? Donna, would you like to start us I think what, yes, <laughs> and so I think what this has highlighted is some of the, of the inequities mm -hmm. in terms of um, service provision, service delivery, and that some communities were harder hit by this, right? Um, but so what I'd like to see moving forward is, is just more equity in terms of how resources or public resources are, are administered, right? I would like to see um, more culturally, um, because Toronto really is, 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 is arguably the most racial diverse city in the world, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think culture, like in order culturally, more culturally, safe spaces uh, services right and a provision and, and less eurocentric dominance if you will right so that because diff there's so many different people right that never access service before right from racialized communities or from you know the dominant culture or whatever but they've never prior to this they've never accessed service and so now they're coming forward and they're asking they're requiring they're needing more culturally safe, culturally relevant, and culturally affirming care, right? And I think what, what this has really highlighted is that for, for, for the most part, the, uh, these services are not readily available. And so moving forward, that's one of the things I'd like to see. And also moving forward, like in terms of equity, the, 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 the reality right now is that we have rich hospitals, we have poor hospitals, right? The rich hospitals are located in the more affluent areas. The, the poor hospitals are mostly, mostly located in mostly racialized, socially dis, um, disadvantaged areas, right? And so that's some of the changes I'd like to see. And, and for more thought, to be given in terms of service planning and service delivery in a way that's equitable and, and some more health justice, if you will, yeah. right? So where there's not this big um, health disparities. So when there's a pandemic, then it does not put one group at a disadvantage yeah. because this is what we saw overwhelmingly mm. with, the, with, the, with you know, folks from the African diaspora. Yeah, definitely. And I think, like you were mentioning even earlier in our discussion, how a lot of our services right now might have more of a one-size-fits-all approach, and that's really not um, what we need. And I think definitely the pandemic has kind of uh, revealed the cracks within our system, and I think those are where we really need to change moving forward. So thank you for raising all of those really important issues. Rima, do you have any final thoughts? Uh, <clears throat> I basically would echo the feelings that Donna had. And I also would mention the fact that I think we need more services in terms of adolescence. Mm -hmm. we, we seem to have a lack of services and resources for that particular group. They sort of fall between the crack. They're not within the children program and they're not really in the adult program. So more resources in that particular aspect. Mm -hmm. And also more services, I think, uh, in the community, especially for substance use. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. reaching out, as Donna had mentioned, going out into the community and addressing those particular issues because they're not coming to the centers. Mm -hmm. We really need to address it where these clients are actually living or basically residing. Yeah. Well, I think that brings us to the end of our discussion. Thank you, Rima and Donna, both for um, you know, enlightening us and sharing all of your thoughts. I think it's been a really informative discussion. Um, and coming up next week in our COVID Decoded series, we will be talking about the public health and policy implications of the pandemic with two experts and professors from the Dalalana School of Public Health at the University of Toronto, Dr. Jeff, Dr. Jeff Kwong and Dr. Vivek Goel. Make sure to tune in next week on Tuesday, July 14th at 3 p.m. to hear more from them. In the meantime, check out the Frontline Feature series on our Instagram, at Raw Talk Podcast, where we are profiling individuals working on the front lines of the pandemic, both within and outside of healthcare. 
if you know anyone that you'd like to nominate for this feature please dm us on instagram or twitter we would also love to hear your feedback about our COVID Decoded series, and you can find the feedback survey link in the video description below. And finally, support the show by using our Amazon affiliate link in the video description. Thank you all again for tuning in, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. And until next time, keep it raw.